Leibniz's Critique of Locke on Human Understanding Excerpt by Gottfried Leibniz, 1646-1716 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. It is unnecessary for us to give complete abstract of this notable book after the author himself has relieved us of this task, since in the year 1688 he prepared such an abstract for Mr. Clare for insertion in his Bibliothèque Universelle, tome 8, page 49 and following, before he gave it to the press. In the year 1690 it appeared first in London in folio, and Mr. Clare again published lengthy excerpts in the said Bibliothèque Universelle, tome 17, page 399. Soon afterwards, a new English edition appeared, enlarged with many pieces, and in particular with an entire chapter on identity and diversity, which he treats in an exceedingly clear and excellent manner. In the second edition mentioned, Locke acknowledges that he erred in the first edition, when he assumed, in accordance with the common view, that what brings the will to any change of action in the course of arbitrary actions is the assurance of a much greater good. For when he considered the matter more carefully, he found that a present unrest which consists in desire or is constantly accompanied by the same, places its limits on the will. For the reasons for this view, see Book 2, Chapter 21. He will gladly, however, be informed of a better view. Some time after, a third, and in the year 1699, a fourth edition appeared, in which last edition Locke either further explained his previous thoughts by many additions or supported them by wholly new grounds. Peter Coste made his translation on the basis of this edition, and when Locke sent him his manuscript, had worked upon the same for more than two years. Locke himself considered this translation a good one and presented his thanks accordingly so that consequently it must be the more welcome by a great deal of us. To enumerate all the new editions would take too long, hence we will content ourselves with the mention of the two most important, which make two separate chapters, of which the first is Book 2, Chapter 33, and treats of the Association of Ideas. Locke says there is almost no one who does not find something in the opinions, conclusions, and actions of other people, which seems to him fantastic and extravagant, and is so in fact. Everyone may have eyes keen-sighted enough to mark the least fault of this kind in the case of another, if only it may be distinguished from his own and he himself may have sufficient understanding to condemn the same, although he also may have in his own opinions and his own conduct the greatest errors of which he might be aware, and of which, were it not impossible, he may yet with difficulty be convinced. This arises, he continues, not merely from self-love, although this passion has often a great part therein, for one daily sees such people lying sick with the same disease who are otherwise skillful and whole enough to make nothing of their own merits. This defect of reason is customarily ascribed to education and to the force of prejudice, and this according to the common opinion, not without cause, but according to Locke's statement, this explanation reaches not to the root of the disease and does not show completely its origin and peculiarity. He himself explains it as follows. Some of our ideas, his own words, have among themselves an exact correspondence and connection. The obligation and highest perfection of our reason consists in the fact that it reveals such ideas and holds them together in the self-same unity and correspondence as that which is grounded in their particular nature. 
there is besides this another bond of ideas which depends upon chance or custom so that the ideas which naturally are wholly unrelated become so exactly united in the minds as spirit of some men so that they can with difficulty be separated from one another they accompany one another constantly and one can no sooner present itself to the understanding intellectui than the others or indeed more of them so united are they appear also nor can they at all be separated from one another this association of ideas which the mind makes in itself either voluntarily or by chance is the sole source of the defect of which we now speak and as this strong union of ideas is not originally caused by nature it is for this reason wholly different in different persons namely according to their different inclinations education and self-interests that there are such associations of ideas which custom begets in the minds of most men no one according to locke's statement can doubt who with much earnestness considers himself and other people and to this cause can perhaps with convenience and reason be ascribed the greater part of those sympathies and antipathies which one finds among men and which work as strongly and produce as regular effects as if they were natural which fact then makes them to be called so although at first view they had no other origin than the chance connection of two ideas which the strength of the first impression or of an excessively great compliance so firmly united that they always thereafter remain together in the mind of the man as though only a single idea locke however in no respect denies that there are wholly natural antipathies which depend upon our original constitution and are born with us he believes however that with proper consideration man would recognize the most of those which have been regarded as natural as in the beginning caused by impressions which were not heeded whether they were suggested sufficiently early or through a ridiculous fancy locke notices incidentally the difference which may be made between natural and acquired antipathies so that those who have children or who must educate them may see how much heed they should take of this principle and with what care this disorderly union of ideas in the mind of the youth should be prevented he thereupon points out by some examples how such a union of ideas which are not of themselves united yet depend one upon another is sufficient to impede our moral and natural action yea more our notions themselves the ideas of goblins or of spirits agrees as little with darkness as with light if however a foolish maid instills and awakens these different ideas in the mind of a child as though they were connected with each other the child during his entire life will perhaps not be able to separate them from each other so that the darkness evermore will seem to him to be accompanied by these horrible ideas if any one has suffered a grievous wrong on account of another he thinks very often of the persons and the deeds and while he thus strongly or for a long time thinks thereupon he at the same time glues these two ideas together so firmly that he makes them almost one as it were and never remembers the person but that the wrong received also enters his head and while he can scarcely distinguish these two things he has just as much aversion for the one as for the other thence it comes locke adds that hatred arises from slight and worthless ideas and quarrels are taken up and continued in the world one of locke's friends was wholly cured of madness by a certain man through a very painful operation for which service he acknowledged himself under great obligation to him throughout his life as he was so circumstanced that he required from no one a greater service during his life reason or gratitude might suggest to him what they would yet he could never bear the sight of his surgeon 
for as the sight of him always brought again to mind the idea of the very great pain which he had been obliged to endure at his hands he could not endure this idea so violent was the impressions it produced in his mind many children hold their books which were the occasion hereto accountable for most of the ill treatment they endured at school and they unite these ideas so well that they regard a book with great disgust and all their life study and books cannot win their love because to them reading which might otherwise have greatly delighted them became a genuine torture an example notable for its singularity is the following which an eminent man who assured him he had himself seen it relates to locke a young man had learned to dance very prettily and perfectly there chanced to stand however in the hall where he first learned an old trunk the idea of which combined so imperceptibly with his turns and steps in the dance that although he could dance incomparably well in this hall he could do this only when the old trunk was there in other places however he could not dance at all unless the old trunk itself or one like it stood in its accustomed place the habitus intellectuals which are contracted through such association of ideas are as locke further informs us just as strong and numerous even though very little heeded supposing the ideas of being and matter were very strongly united either by education or by an excessively great application to these two ideas according as they are combined in the mind what notions and reasonings would they not produce concerning different spirits if a custom accepted from childhood up had united a form or figure with the idea of god into what absurdities would such a thought in the contemplation of deity not plunge us we shall no doubt find locke adds that it is nothing else than similar ill-grounded and unnatural combinations of ideas which break the path for the many conflicting sects in philosophy and religion for it is not to be supposed that each member of these different sects is willingly deceived and against his better knowledge and conscience rejects the truth demonstrated to him by clear evidence it is indeed certain that sometimes interests assist greatly in this sort of thing yet no one could affirm that it could captivate and lead astray whole societies so that they all none excepted should affirm plain and deliberate falsehoods for it must be that some at least do what others pretend to do namely seek truth sincerely therefore there must be something which blinds their understanding and hinders them from recognizing the falsehood of what they consider as pure and refined truth if we now investigate accurately what takes reason prisoner and darkens the understanding of otherwise sincere people we find that it is simply and solely some free ideas which properly speaking really have no bond among themselves but which by education custom and uninterrupted action on their part are so united in the mind that they can no more be separated and distinguished from one another than a single idea thence it comes locke continues that often the crudest things are taken for worthy opinions absurdities for demonstrations and intolerable and absurd results for strong and fluent reasonings end of leibniz's essay on locke's essay of human understanding excerpt by gottfried leibniz sixteen forty six to seventeen sixteen